and everyone should get a notification now. Yes, okay, perfect. Yes, welcome again, Russ. Uh, um, we are very excited to improve our skills in terms of uh, good scientific writing and also thinking, of course, in that respect. So I will give you the stage at this point. Thanks very much. I, I think we have fundamentally misunderstood the connection between science and communication, or at least we haven't appreciated it, how profound that connection is. Um, and this has had many consequences. The first thing is, is that it makes it difficult. It makes a lot of normal daily tasks that scientists have to do very difficult because you have to communicate all the time. Um, I think that what's missing, what has been partly missing is a model of the relationship between science and communication, what it should be like, how it can go wrong. And what I've found in my experience as a teacher is that if I start the way we're going to start today by introducing you to a model and showing you how it works, um, that can have a pretty significant effect, not only on how you communicate your science, but also it can even affect your research. And so I put this together in what I call a manifesto. And again, let me just repeat these points because these are really important. These two things are connected at a profound level that I think has been poorly understood. Um, if we understand the relationship, to understand that we need a model of how science communication works. And if you learn the model, it's going to make a lot of things easier. It's going to make the way that you communicate science easier. It's going to make the way that you learn science easier. It will change the way we teach science. And what I'm going to try to prove to you, which is which has been very difficult, and I've worked on this for a number of years, is to try to prove to you that if we do this, it, it will actually change the way that you think about your research and it will make you a better scientist. This, this is a big challenge for me. I, I know this well, that um, scientists usually put this communication into a category of soft skills, what they consider soft skills. And I think that's a bad name for things because it's so fundamental to what we do in science, how we do science and the goal of what we're trying to do that if you just think of it like a pretty package that you're trying to wrap around something, or if you think about it as a sales pitch or some kind of marketing, that you'll do it in a way that's not helpful to your work. And so I'm gonna, the structure of today's work is gonna be like this. Um, the first hour and 15 minutes, I'm gonna tell you a long story about my failures as a science communicator. So I've been doing this for 20 some years now. I do not have a background in molecular biology or the natural sciences. I studied psychology and linguistics because I wanted to become a writer, which makes perfect sense, of course. Um, but I found that when those two areas of studies, then when I suddenly got a job um, um, writing about science, I was also asked to teach people to, to communicate science because I was the communications expert. And I had a lot of difficulties both learning the science and teaching other people to talk about it. That was actually a good pair of problems to have to confront at the same time. And again, I'm going to tell you a story about this because I found that what I need to do is I need to help you build a structure in your head. I need to help you draw a picture in your head. And I'm going to try to do that through this story. So that's going to be the first block. The second block is going to be about what I call ghosts and showing you some tricks that we can use, um, how actually what we're doing in communication can affect your research. And then in the afternoon, we're going to turn all of this model and theory stuff into really practical, practical strategies that you can use both to learn science, to teach science, and to communicate science. These things are all connected to each other. And we're, and, and the model that I have developed is very easy to translate into a very practical 
practical system that you can use to communicate. And so in the afternoon, we're gonna start that process. We'll have another day in about three weeks. Before that time, you'll have an assignment which we'll discuss this afternoon. Uh, it won't be, it won't take you a lot of time, but it will be an important one. Um, you'll send that back to me, I'll work on it, and then we'll meet again and we'll take this first step towards seeing how all of this works practically. Um, you know, I couldn't teach you to play the piano by talking about it. And I also can't teach you to communicate by talking at you about it. So um, that's going to be the structure today. Now, all of this works best if I can engage your minds. So the first thing that I tried to do to engage your minds in this process is to, to throw out a challenge by telling you, I think most of us don't understand the connection between science and communication. If we do, that can change a lot of things. It will also change your work. So that's the challenge. I need to fulfill that. And as we go along, you need to try to relate all of these weird, crazy things that I'm telling you to your work and, and to what you're doing. And in the end, what I'm saying, it should feel natural to you. It should feel like I've understood how you think and I've described how you think. Um, and in a way, what I've been doing for the last 20 years is trying to figure out how my own brain works so that I can explain that to someone else. And if I can do that, then we'll be successful here. Now, it's one of the things I, I it's much better to do this in a group and to see you in person because then there's all kinds of interactions that can take place. That can't really happen here. Um, and it's the, the most difficult thing about running an online course is is the discussions. And so please, as we go along, right into the chat function and Pamela will be monitoring that. And so when we take breaks to discuss um, any ideas that you have or any comments or questions you have, that's the time when we'll take those on. And of course we will open it up to a normal discussion. Um, okay, so all of this that we're doing today started because when I was hired by the EMBL in Heidelberg, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, I was hired to become a science writer for them. And I didn't know science. And I was also asked at the same time to teach people how to write because I was a writer, so I should know. And I was immediately confronted with all kinds of strange problems. Um, the, the thing that surprised me most was that although scientists are absolute experts in their areas and they have to communicate all the time they have all kinds of problems with this with this and the the biggest reason for it is that they're just not trained so i come from the united states and in america and in the anglo-saxon world we get trained in this all the way through school and and at the university and so you just it, it's it's part of your bread and butter you learn it um Obviously, another issue is that many scientists have, you know, you're not native English speakers. And so you're going to have to communicate in English a lot of times, and that poses problems of its own. But, but the strangest thing to me was that scientists, the, those weren't the real interesting problems or the, even the major problems. The major problems were that when scientists have to describe their own work, they have all kinds of problems that I really didn't quite understand. For example, um, real classical types of things. Um, uh, and those, those problems fell into kind of categories. So for example, um, people had a lot of trouble distinguishing main points from details. They got lost in the trees. You know? uh, they would give a piece of information without give, putting it into any context or explaining why we should know it or why that's important. Um, they would describe a set of ideas, but there would be strange gaps or jumps in logic. And, and, and the largest issue of all, which is always an issue, it's an issue for me as a writer and a lot of other people, is just trying to put this massive chemical thinking that we have in our brains into language and do that in the clearest possible way. The result of failing is... If, if you have trouble with these things, the result is sometimes you, you have done a good job at, at, at saying something or communicating something that you think you have, but the other person doesn't understand and um, they can often misinterpret that. A lot of times they think that 
the reason they didn't understand is because you're trying to hide something from them. You're being purposefully mysterious. Science is scary. Science is mysterious. And probably all of you will run up against this at some time. I mean, we're suffering this at a great to a great extent today with all of the weird stuff going on about vaccines and, and the disease and everything. You're, we're seeing this, you know, if a lack of transparency often is taken to mean something mysterious or dangerous. Now, this is not a universal problem. I have had the great luck during my career to talk to a bunch of Nobel Prize winners. I tried to sat, sit down and count them last night, and I think it's 12 or 13. And I've had a real chance to talk to these people for an hour or so informally um, or to interview them. And what I found was at that level of science, these people often turn out to be extremely good communicators. And they're not only good at communicating to their peers, but they're also really good at explaining things to the public or you know, to their grandparents or whoever. And so um, I thought this was interesting. And it for me, it raised a couple of questions. It, it raised the question, is there, a que is there a connection between doing really good science and being able to communicate well? Because it seemed like there was, and trying to understand that connection has been the basis of my work now for almost 20 years. I mean, I've written lots of books about science and I've written thousands of articles about science and worked with all kinds of researchers. Last week, I did this course for a group of theoretical physicists. That was scary because uh, I had known nothing about theoretical physics. I'm much more comfortable now in molecular biology after 20 years. But anyway, they, they have the same kinds of problems. And so I decided to try to understand where these problems came from. And to do this, I took what I call, a, a, I took a scientific approach, um, a sort of genetic approach. And you know that in the early days of genetics, um, the, the Thomas Hunt Morgan and his group of fly researchers, they looked for flies with mutations because they understood that if they saw a mutation and they could, they could pinpoint it to a specific gene looking at patterns of heredity, they could say, okay, this is a defect. It's actually trying to tell me what the healthy function of the gene is. So I thought communication problems can tell us something about good communication and they can also tell us something about good scientific thinking because I realized quite early on the problem was less with writing or the process of, of preparing a talk. It was more with the thinking that goes into that process. And so I spent five years, I had lots of classes like this. It was very frustrating because I didn't have a model and I didn't have a system to understand the kinds of problems I was seeing. And a lot of, you'll find all kinds of communication trainers and teachers out there. And some of them do a great job, but I was very surprised to find that there was no real model of how this should work out there. So I tried to develop one. And in the process, I discovered some things that surprised me a lot. The first thing that I found was that you know that it's very difficult to communicate science to a non-expert, but the kinds of problems, the types of problems that I was seeing in those kinds of situations were very similar to similar problems that I could see when experts were talking to each other. For example, somebody would send off their paper and they would get a rejection that didn't seem to make sense. It looked like the reviewer hadn't read their paper. A lot of times the scientists told me, I don't think this guy even read the paper. When I looked at the paper, I could say, I think he did. I think he just completely misunderstood what you were trying to say. And so, so there's a connection between these two things. And I believe strongly that if, you, if I can teach you to talk to your grandparents about your work, it will make all of your issues when talking to experts and your colleagues, it'll make them very easy. It'll, it, it's a, it will solve also those problems. So the most significant problems arise from the way scientists think about their works and also their understanding what the goal of communication is. And so those are things we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about how you think about science and we're also gonna talk about what the goals of communication are. And I'm gonna do this using really specific examples. And what I, what I discovered that was, it wasn't a complete surprise to me because I had experienced many times that working on the, the text of a paper 
also had some kind of effect on the quality of the science and the and the work itself. It's the 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 end effect was I am an author now on ten papers, scientific papers. I never asked to become this, but my contribution to thinking through the papers and helping them and helping them rebuild the logic of those papers was significant enough that the scientists uh, thought that I should be made an author. And I think the best case that I can make for the value of what we're doing today is that I have no training, no formal training in molecular biology, any of these fields, but I, because of the work that we're doing and because of the kinds of things we're doing today, I was working on evolution and I generated a novel hypothesis and a friend of mine said, oh, then nobody's tested that before, let's do it. And so I'm, one of my ideas became a paper also. So um, I don't have a PhD or anything, but anyways, so, so understanding why these problems occur can, can help you not only improve your communication and make it much, much simpler, but it can also change how you think about your work and, and give you new ideas about research. Oh, there's a cat. I love that. Wonderful. The cat has joined us. How great. So to, 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 to show you, to start to show you how all of this works, I'm going to give you an example of one of the first stories that I had to write about when I, when I began um, writing about science. And that is, um, there's a thing in cells, perhaps, that we call lipid rafts. And lipid rafts, this was a hypothesis that scientists at, uh, scientists at Embel had developed a long time ago. And the idea was quite simple. And that is on the cell membrane, you have a bunch of molecules. You have lipid molecules and you have proteins and yeah, and maybe some RNA is attached here, but in any case, you have proteins and lipids. And a lot of times in order to achieve some function to get a signal from the outside or to recognize something, um, multiple molecules or clusters of molecules have to work together. And so the question that the scientist asked himself was, how does the cell cluster those molecules? Are they, are they packed together in some kind of structure or are they just kind of randomly associating with each other? And he came up with this idea that inside the cell as proteins are being, are being uh, produced, for export to the membrane, they're glued together with cholesterol into these rafts, and then they're shipped out in a kind of prefabricated way. And this was an idea and there was some evidence for it, but nobody really had proof of it. So scientists at my institute developed a kind of microscope that could be used to investigate this. And the microscope was called optical tweezers. And what you did was, here you have a cell, here you have some receptor proteins on the surface, and they coated beads with antibodies that would bind to that receptor. And then they trapped this bead in what's called um, optical tweezers, which is a laser that, that basically grabs the bead and holds onto it. And this laser, if the bead then moves, as it moves, it, 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 it can be tracked in the laser and it can also be pulled around a little bit and pushed around and they can monitor very precisely how much force it takes to move the bead. So I hope that I hope that's clear so far. And, and the, then the scientist explained this very simply to me. He said, okay, have you ever been fishing? I'm from Kansas. Kansas, we go fishing most of our lives. So I've been fishing. Well, you know that if you throw your line into the water and if you have a big fish on the line, it's hard to pull in. And if it's a small fish or you don't have any fish on the line, it's really easy to pull in. So he said, imagine that that's what the laser is and the bead, that's the lasers are a fishing line and the bead is the lure and, and, the, and the, the lipid raft is a fish. If it's there, it's a big thing, it's hard to pull in. If it's not there, if these proteins are just kind of floating around singly, then it's easy and, and it, then they don't exist or whatever. So I thought that was a great, that was a perfect example. And, and it was so kind. There were so many things about the way he told me this story that made it easy for me to understand. I was very happy. And then I went back to try to write this story and I got stuck. And I got stuck because 
it took me a long time to figure out why I was stuck. And it took the scientists a long time to figure out why I was stuck. And we just kept discussing this. And still there was something in my head that was not right. I knew I did not understand this story. And finally we figured it out. And that is the last time I learned about cells and membranes was in the eighth grade in Mr. Schnitker's class in Kansas. And Mr. Schnitker told us that cells have membranes around them and it's kind of like a wall. And so I was thinking, okay, so I didn't know the difference between a membrane and a cell wall. And so I thought, how do you pull a fish through a wall? If you try to do that, you would break the wall or you would kill the fish or the line would snap, something bad would happen. And it took us a long time to figure out that there was a problem here because, and, and finally what happened was the scientist told me, oh, you're, you're thinking of a membrane the wrong way. You have to think of it more like a soap bubble. Think of it like a soap bubble. A, a soap bubble, that made sense. A soap bubble is liquid and you could have like dust or things floating around in it. And you, it's, it's made out of these fat molecules. So you could imagine it's more like a liquid. So what was happening was the scientist had this thing in his head and what he had in his head was what we call the fluid mosaic model. And the fluid mosaic model tells us that membranes are made of these fat molecules, a double lipid bilayer with other molecules embedded in them and floating around in them. And that's what a membrane is to a scientist. It's not a wall. And so what I did, what, what I realized was what was, most people think that the reason why scientists and other people can't communicate easily with each other is that scientists just know a lot of facts that other people don't know. And that turns out to be very seldom the case. What was missing was, for me, this image of a membrane. The scientist had a picture, had a, had a model of a membrane in his mind. And um, why didn't he tell me that model? Because every scientist knows what a membrane's like. And so it turned out that the thing that I needed to understand most to understand this story was exactly the thing he didn't tell me. And that happens so many times because, because what I realized, this was my first clue of something really fundamental that's going on. And that is that scientists have all kinds of things in their head. In fact, they have a whole laboratory in their head. I call this the inner laboratory. You each have an inner laboratory in your head where there's all kinds of things in there. Um, there's things like what a membrane is like. It, it contains lots of facts, of course, like how big is a cell and what, are, what stuff is in a cell and what is DNA composed of. It contains facts and definitions, but it contains a lot more than that. And to show you everything that's in your inner laboratory, just to open this door. So, and if I wanted to understand the scientist, I had to have my own inner laboratory. I had to see what was going on in there. First of all, he had to know that he had this thing. And secondly, he had to know that I didn't have one and he needed to be able to, to understand the story he was trying to tell and tell in a way I could understand. Well, I'm gonna just show you now a little text that comes from a real paper that I was working on last year. And we're gonna look at this text because I'm gonna show you everything that's in there. This is just a really normal text, okay? So here we have the one, I don't know if any of you work on beta catenin, if you're working in cancer, some of you are certainly working on beta catenin. Anyway, so cells constantly produce and degrade the molecule beta catenin. Normally it's bound to a complex that is targeted for destruction. Signaling by wind blocks the formation of this complex, leaving higher quantities of beta catenin that means it can enter the nucleus and activate target genes. Now, I'm sure that all of you understand that text. If you don't, there's a reason you don't understand it. And I could tell you why, in fact. But, but let's just look at everything in here. So this starts to show us some of the stuff. What is in here? There's names of things like beta catenin. There's names of processes. So you need to know what produce and degrade mean. You need to know what a complex is. You need to know that that's a made of molecules, made of proteins, and beta catenin is a protein. Um, signaling, you need to know, so you need to know a bunch of terms, but you also know how ideas are linked to each other. For example, what does produce mean? 
wow, that's, that's producing this molecule, that's a complicated process. You need to know how ideas are related to each other. For example, complex, what's the relationship between a molecule and a complex? You also need to know, you, have, you need to have a picture of the geography of a cell. You need to have a map of a cell in your mind. And, and what this text is doing is describing a sequence of events that occur in a certain order. And you would be amazed how many times when scientists describe a little film in their head, they don't start at the beginning and go to the end. It's really interesting. For example, beta catenin is in the middle of a signaling pathway. It's not the first step. And if when, when I was reading, one of the first things that happened when I read this paper was I said, well, you know, beta catenin, why do we even call it's it's called the, you know, anyway, we'll go on. Let's go on. So I'll show you, we have in order to understand the story, you need to have these kinds of models in your head. One is you need to have um, you need to have a picture of the cell. So here's the nucleus because we're going to talk about the nucleus. We have a signal from Wnt, which is outside the cell. And you would be amazed, but two weeks ago I taught a course, this course for biologists and bioinformaticists. So I had a bioinformaticist in the course who was working on signaling pathways and. You would not believe this. I was, we were all completely shocked, but no one had ever told him that a signaling pathway happens inside of a cell. Nobody told him that Wnt was outside the cell and it had to dock onto a receptor. He was only thinking of this in terms of sort of, okay, one thing happens, one thing happens, one thing, a sequence, but he didn't realize that that was associated with a geography of the cell. I mean, we got that fixed, okay? So here's one way of representing this. Here's a model which has some information about the names of things, some information about their positions, and some information about the geography of the cell. Here's another way of looking at a similar signaling cascade. This one's for NF-kappa B. There's another way to represent that information. And you have some of this stuff in your head. I don't know if you could draw one of these in all of its complexity, but you have something like this in your head. And this is another way of representing um, the, uh, I think the TNF alpha or NF kappa B, I'm not sure. It's another way of representing a signaling pathway. There's all different ways of representing this. Here's even another way. This is a, an algorithm in which um, people are trying to figure out where you could intervene in NF kappa B signaling to have a potent effect on that system because it's also involved in, in cancer. Now, I've just shown you four different ways of representing the same kind of thing, okay? And these are all models. They're all abstract. That means they're not real. Um, you know that the reality is it's actually not like this, that there's, you know, how many copies of this receptor are there on a cell? There's lots. All of these things only happen because there's millions or billions of these things running around at the same time. We have no clue really how a transcription factor, when it enters the nucleus, finds a target gene and binds to it. We don't know. There's lots of models and hypotheses, but we don't know how this works. So a scientist learns to represent, they have, you have, you've built the system in your head to think about something like a signaling pathway. It's an abstract system, which has some positional information. It has some relationships, like it has some terms like transcription factor. Transcription factor has a meaning. It usually refers to a protein that's translated in the cytoplasm, moves back to the nucleus, docks onto DNA, activates genes, blah, blah, blah. Actually, some of them turn out not to do that, but that's okay. We still call them that. Um, you know how to unpack these simplified descriptions, and you also know how to connect them to experimental systems and data. But the way that you do this is kind of bizarre. I'm gonna show you something about how you think. So for example, I was working on this paper with a scientist and here's an example of the packing and unpacking, the secret packing and unpacking that someone does to understand this text. He was working on this bioinformatics system and he said, okay, cells. I asked him immediately, what type of cell? What species are you talking about? And he looked at me and he said, oh, it doesn't matter. I was saying, okay, 
why, how should I know that it doesn't matter? It's usually kind of important, especially if you're talking about cancer, maybe we should know what kind of cell anyway, but he didn't care because this was all, so produce is a complex, that's gene expression. And you all know how complicated gene expression is, right? And it only happens under certain conditions it doesn't happen all the time. So cell, well, actually they pretty much do always produce beta continuum, at least, you know, eukaryotes, but okay. Um, molecule, what kind of molecule we're we talking about? Well, here we're talking about a protein, but you know, the same word is used to refer to DNA and RNA and just understanding how those things are connected and how those are connected to isoforms and variants. And each individual person has a slightly different version is a very complicated thing. Um, signaling by Wendt blocks the formation of this complex. When, when I see these pictures of complexes, I always think, oh, that's nice. And actually I found out that in a lot of cases, scientists didn't have the slightest clue of what was bound to what inside that complex at what places. It was like having a Lego set that you didn't have any instructions. You knew all the pieces, but you didn't know what it was supposed to build. So all of these things are based on models that you have in your head that you've built yourself based on information coming in. If you, were, you had nice professors and you were really lucky, they talked to you about those models as they were helping you build them in your head. But a lot of times they didn't. So for example, they would show you a text like this with, without actually showing you everything that was in there and how it related to each other. And so things can happen like a bioinformaticist can go away not knowing that all of this happens actually in the cytoplasm up until a certain point, except for Wnt, which is outside the cell. Huh, okay. So these are all based on models. And when we talk about these models, we pack them and unpack them. Hopefully we do it in the same way. Again, I was thinking it may be important. He says it's not important in the case that I'm talking about. How should I know that? And if I'm submitting a paper and getting feedback on the paper, maybe what's going wrong is the packing and unpacking on both sides. We don't do it the same way. And there's, and in fact, it's very difficult to determine that we do it the same way. Now, to understand this simple, simple story, actually, this story, the only reason that you understand it is because you have models in your head. Um, you have models, for example, forget this, um, but you have models of evolution, cell biology, gene expression, biochemistry, structural biology, physics. Every story that you're working on somehow relates to all of these things. And the reason why you understand things, what things mean in science, what this means is based on how it fits into all of these models. Unfortunately, a lot of times we forget to say that. So anyway. Now, those models and what's in your head, your inner laboratory that I've been talking about, it's invisible. And it causes all kinds of problems. And I'm going to show you the kind of problem that causes using a different example. I'm going to show you the next screen, you're going to see something. And I promise you that all of us will see the same thing, but we will also see something different. Okay, here we go. So we're all looking at the same image, okay? But those of us who play chess see something different than those of us who don't play chess. And those of us who play really good chess, which is not me, see something different than those of us who play mediocre or bad chess like, like me. So when, when you look at this, you see different things. And what you see is, uh, is different because of something in your head, uh, in my head, in your head. And the same thing is true of all of these scientific systems we're talking about. We have an invisible, so I have an invisible laboratory of chess. And if you don't play chess, then your invisible laboratory of chess is a lot like my invisible laboratory of science at the beginning. There wasn't very much in there. So what, 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 what is it? What is it that a chess player knows? A chess player has a mental model of the game and the model describes the pieces that are in the system. It describes the rules by which they move. And it also has some larger things in it like what, what are they for? What's the goal of the game? White plays, black plays in alternation, things like that. 
And if you have this model, then you can look at this board and you can answer questions like, is it even possible that this situation exists? For example, there might be too many pieces on the board. There might be the wrong pieces on the board. They could be in a configuration that could never really happen in a game. Um, if, if you look at this board, most people are gonna say, okay, what happens next? So you can use your knowledge of the rules and your knowledge of the pieces and your understanding of the situation to make predictions about what will come. And you can also go backwards and say, how did we get here? And again, depending on how good you are, you can do that better or worse. This is exactly what we're trying to do in science. And in science, the models that we use in science are trying to do something similar. Now, model, models in science are not like games because a game is an artificial system where the rules have been determined in advance, all the pieces are known. In the systems you're working on in science, we don't even know all the pieces and we don't really know the rules. We've made some guesses about the rules by watching how the systems behave, but we don't really know what they are. And so it works differently, but, but you get the idea. Now, I needed, as I was working on science communication, I kept finding situations where the problems I was having understanding people had to do with the fact that I was a bad chess player, or I didn't know what game they were playing. And I needed a word to describe the difference between what I knew and what a scientist knew. I had this concept of the inner laboratory, but there were these invisible things and these invisible things that were hard to find were disrupting communication all the time. So I found a name and that is, I call them ghosts. So. A ghost is invisible knowledge that somehow disrupts communication, just like the way that we normally think of ghosts. If it were here, we couldn't see it, but it could cause some problems. Okay, so ghosts are information concepts, patterns, or all kinds of other knowledge that are not in the talk or the text or the image. For example, that little text about beta catenin, it didn't tell us this is part of a signaling pathway, its function is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just gave us a bunch of information. But, but in order to understand that text, I need to know these things. So in order to understand the lipid raft story that I told you at the beginning, I needed to know what a membrane is like. And learning to see that these ghosts exist and identifying them is essential for learning and communicating science. And it's, it's not only essential, but it can be extremely, if you know that they're there and you know how to find them, it can help you in so many ways because it can speed things up. I can look at a paper now and in two minutes, I can tell you what it's about, why they're, why they're writing this paper and kind of what it means. And, and the same thing happens again. I, can, I went to a group of theoretical physicists last week and I did not understand most of what they told me about their work that I could always tell them what I needed to know to understand it. And th this works very well. So you can move, if you're talking across disciplinary boundaries, um, then, um, then they, this is extremely important because there are all kinds of ghosts. The further the differences between your knowledge and the person you're talking to, the more ghosts they are and the more fundamental they are. But they also occur between scientists because they're ghosts in the way you pack and unpack the, those kinds of things we were talking about before. The bioinformaticist had been talking to his colleagues for weeks and months about signaling. And they thought they understood each other, but they did not understand each other because he didn't know this basic fundamental thing that all of that signaling happens inside of a cell. And so it sounds like you're talking about the same thing, but you're not really. So, Ghosts disrupt communication. That should be obvious, I think. And they also disrupt research because when you look at a system, there are ghosts in the way that you think about it. Um, it's hidden knowledge. You have assumptions, you have simplified things, you have an image of it in your mind, which is not the real image. It's an abstract one that you've built, or it's something someone told you, or it, it could be that the model you're working with has flaws in it, and those shape how you see this system. And that's bad for science. So the question is, if that's bad for science, how are we gonna see, how are we gonna find ghosts? And the easiest way to find them is through communication.
And it's sometimes the only way to find them. And I'm gonna show you another fantastic example of this um, that most people find really surprising. And that is, so what we're talking about is this inner laboratory in your head. It has a structure it has an architecture there are things in there and they're in certain places and they're related to each other in certain ways so let's look at some real architecture let's use a metaphor of architecture and and here's a picture of we have this um building out in Buch where I work on the campus uh, which is the old Bimsby building and and um in any case uh in this picture you can see everything you can see the walls you can see the electrical system. You can see the, the water system. You can see the ventilation. There's so much stuff in here that even an architect can't read this to, to, um, to read this. The architecture has to peel apart all those layers. Now, this is too complicated for me. So let's look at something simpler. And that is my sister. I asked her to draw a picture of her house. Okay, so this is the sister. This is a drawing my sister drew of her house. Now, I told you I studied psychology, I studied developmental psychology, and that means the phases that children go through when they learn to think and become adults. And, you know, we began with a kind of very sort of basic, primitive kind of body-oriented thinking, and then it becomes very complicated and abstract. And I knew that children see space differently than adults do. And my, my sister has, she's much older than I am. She has grandchildren. Um, she has, she, in fact, she has two eight-year-old, she had at that time, she had two eight-year-old grandchildren who were identical twins. So this was important because I needed a control group, okay? So I had my sister, who's the adult. What do you think if you ask her eight-year-old grandchildren to draw this space, what do you think they will draw? I'm going to show you what the row. Here's twin number one. And this is what I call the octopus house. So it has these kind of big things and these tentacles and the rooms are at the end. Now, if you look at this carefully, you notice that everything is kind of in the right place. So here's the living room. Here's the living room. Here's the kitchen. Here's uh, one bedroom. Here's another bedroom closet, bath. I'm not quite sure what all this is. This is the bathroom. So everything is in the right place relative to each other. His identical twin brother drew the same thing. This is how he drew the place. And he drew again. You can see that everything is pretty much in the right place. You have the living room, the kitchen, downstairs, um, the bedrooms, and the bathroom. And he also has the backyard, which is massive. It's true. It's, it's massive. But, but when you look at these pictures and you compare them, you discover that children, there's two things that, at least two things that children don't understand that adults understand about the way space is organized. And the first thing they don't understand is, I usually give people time to think about this and to look at this, and you can figure it out if you do. But the first thing they don't understand is that the wall of one room is the back of the wall of the next room. And you can do this experiment with a little kid, tell him, go in the next room. I'm going to knock on the wall right here. And you have to guess where you're going to hear that sound. And they can't do it. And that's interesting because I don't know if this was like this for you. When I was a child, I grew up in a, it wasn't a big house, but you know, there was a basement, there were several rooms and everything. And I always wondered whether there might be secret passageways and secret spaces in the house, a secret room maybe. And the reason that I thought this was, I didn't realize that all of that space was taken up by something that you could actually test this if you measured the rooms. So I, again, I knew where everything was and I could find it and I could tell someone how to get there. And the second thing that the children don't know is that all of the stuff inside has to fit into the shape of the outside. So if you walk around the house, it's a square. And you, if you walked around this, it would need to be a square too. Again, what do they think is happening in all of this space? The key point is that children see space fundamentally differently than adults do. And did you know that? Probably not. And the only way that you find this out is by making them draw the house. So again, children organize their knowledge very differently adults. 
it shows that this example shows that they lack two rules that every adult knows. And if you were to draw your apartment or your house, you would automatically try to, I mean, I, I'm bad at this and judging relative space sizes and stuff, but I would put everything in the right place and I would make sure the walls were connected to each other. And the only way that you know that children think differently is by making them draw this. And so communication exposes these very, very fundamental ghosts so I told you at the beginning, I think we've misunderstood the function of communication because it, it communication becomes the way that we check to see if my inner space, my laboratory is the same as your space. And it becomes the way that we negotiate this. So it's a game board. Communication is the board that we're playing science on and, and the board is there. So imagine trying to learn chess without a board. There, there are people, there were, you know, if you've seen the Queen's Gambit, which is great, you know, you should watch this. Um, uh, uh, you can, there are people who can play chess without a board, but they always start with a board by learning it. And, you know, there's even codes that you can use to, to exchange. You can say E4, and the other person says E5, right? So you can even exchange codes. But imagine having to try to figure out only based on those codes that there's a board and that there are pieces, it would be very difficult. And I've actually tried this with a group. I've, I've just given them the codes of the game without telling them that it was a chess game. And it took them a long time even to figure out that it was a game and so on and so on. So, so you need a board to play on. If you're gonna play this very complicated game of science, you need a board to play on. And the board is communication. So that's what it's for. And so, this inner laboratory you have is invisible. If I don't communicate with you, I can't see how your knowledge is organized and you can't even see how your own knowledge is organized. I'm gonna show you this, some great examples of this later. To communicate, the very first thing that you need to do is you need to understand the structure a little bit of this laboratory inside. You need to know what's there and where, it's, where it is and what's connected to each other. And then there's another step, and that is you have to guess, okay, what is it about all of this that my audience doesn't know? And what patterns or what kind of laboratory do they have in their head? And you'll find they don't know anything about science, but they have many, many, many things in there that are like science that you can use to communicate it. And this is going to be an important thing that comes up over and over again. Now, these ghosts, they happen on all kinds kinds of communication. And the best example I can give you is when I was unfortunately in America before the election, I had all, I come from Kansas, which is one of those bad red states. And um, people would tell me things like, I voted for Donald Trump because he's going to make America great again. And I had no idea what they meant. And I tried to figure out what they meant by drawing these kinds of charts and maps. And, and it was just hopeless because there's no, there's no logic to it. It's completely psychotic, sociopathic, whatever, I don't know. And it's based on weird things that, you know, they're not at all scientific. But, but what I found was very interesting. In science, if there's a ghost, you can find it and I can tell you what it is. So if I don't understand something, it's because you're giving me a piece of information and I'm missing the links. I'm missing, I don't see what, I, I may not know what it means, but usually it's more, you, you have a pattern in your mind that I don't see. And in science, you can find those patterns. So I'm gonna give you an example again of another example of a real scientific piece of scientific communication. And this was from a press release. And we're gonna use this example many times. I just wanna read it through one time really quickly. And that is, um, the, the story was a story from Emble. They wrote it after I left. Um, it's always nice when you leave a place and you know they, they can't do anything. I'm just kidding. No, don't tell them this. <laughs> and anyway, so, so the story was like this. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. The same is true for many other organisms that are easier to study than humans. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts and have come a close step closer to understanding their function. The study redefines the concept of promoters, the start sites of transcription, contradicting the established notion that they support transcription in one direction only. The results are also representative of transcription in humans. I'm gonna make two predictions. 
The first prediction is you understand what the story is about. And the second prediction is that no one else would understand if they're not a molecular biologist or if they haven't studied these things before, will understand what this text is about. And the reason is one, one very, very fundamental thing that we need to decide before we even begin is what's the goal? So this was written as a press release. It was written for the common person on the street and to and they hoped that they would send it out to newspapers and the newspapers would say, oh, that's a fantastic story. We're gonna print it just like you wrote it because you wrote it so nicely. And of course that didn't happen, but this raises the question, what's the goal? What are we trying to communicate? And if, 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 we, can have, if we have that goal, what test can we perform to measure whether we succeeded at that or not? And this is the point in the course where I usually, if, if we're all sitting in a big room, we sit around and we discuss this for a little while. Um, to, to save time, let me just try to pull that together. But, but this is something that you should always think about before you do anything, before you write a paper, before you write, give a talk, anything. What's the goal? And, and how will I know whether I've succeeded or not? In science, you do this all the time. You always, there's always a reason for what you're doing and you can always determine whether it's worked or not. Well, what's the equivalent for communication? Well, for sure, I'm not trying to get you to memorize a bunch of sentences or a list of facts. I, I, I want to do more than that. So I don't want you just to be able to go out and recite this to learn it by heart and recite it. No, I want you to be able to explain to somebody what it means. Well, to explain to somebody what it means, what does that mean? Well, first of all, you have to understand something. And if you understand it, then you ought to be able to retell the story. And it doesn't matter how you retell this story. Every one of them, if you've understood it, every one of those ways will be correct. And if they're not, you learn something. Okay, so, so if you've really understood it, then the words don't matter. There's lots of ways to tell that story. And then there's an extra thing, and that is I want you to be able to use those ideas somehow. So they should have a meaning for you. You should, you should not only be able to, to retell the story, but you should understand what it means to you somehow. So is that story important to me? Should I care? Why is it important to scientists? Um, when I began writing about science, I decided, um, I made a very fundamental decision. And the first decision was, I'm gonna to learn to tell the scientist's story. I don't care how hard it is or how weird it is. I'm gonna to learn to tell that story. And I'm going to, it's gonna be my problem to explain it to people. But so, so I'm gonna give you one more example of how not to teach science or not to communicate science. And that is, I'm going to use the example of the solar system. Now, I know that you, when you were all young children, probably second, third grade, I don't know, you learned about the solar system. You learned about the sun. This is how the French learn the solar system. They get this nice poster for their classroom. And in the center, there's the sun or le soleil in French. And then you have all the planets. And I can tell you the names of, so there's a lot of other stuff in here besides just the sun and planets. There's space junk and, weird things, I don't know, I don't know what all that is. And there's little spaceships where I leave in too. Um, here's a different version of the, the solar system. And I can tell you what the planets are. First you have the sun, and then you have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And the reason I can tell you all those names in the right order is because when I was in school, we learned a little sentence. And that sentence was, my very educated mother, just served us nine pickles. And so when you took the test, you wrote Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and pickles on the test because, you know, you had the sentence. In mind. Anyway, so you probably learned a sentence like that. But I would like you to do more than just know the names of things. If, if I really teach you this pattern and teach you this system, I want you to be able to use it. So for example, a lot of people, parents buy their kids telescopes and then they go outside at night and they try to find stuff, right? So here's the first challenge using this model, which you all learned in grade school. Can you go outside and in three seconds, find all of the planets, only the planets, not stars, 
just the planets. So there's about, we can see Venus, we can see Mars, we can see Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, I'm not sure. I, we can see those, okay? So if you can see those, can you find them? And most people, unfortunately, can't do it very quickly. But if you understood the model, you could do it. And I'm gonna show you how this works. I'm gonna teach you a trick, okay? I'm gonna use my table here. I'm gonna show you the table that I'm sitting at. So um, we use the hand cleaner as the sun. Gotta get all this stuff up. This is the sun. And we have the sun in the middle, and then we have the red bull as Earth, and then we have, let's say, Mars, and we have some other planets. And the first thing you need to know about this system is that when these planets go around the sun, they all travel around it in the same plane. So, so we have the Earth going around, we have Mars going around. We don't have a planet that goes around the table like this. They're all sitting on this flat surface, okay? That's the first thing you need to know. The second thing you need to know is that as the earth turns, this is, this is us, we're sitting here where this bull is on the red bull can. As the earth turns, it turns perpendicular to that plane, okay? So if you do two things, if you understand the connections between the system and you put your brain onto this one spot and you look at that system from that point of view, that's where we are on the earth, then you can figure out how to find the planets because you understand you don't have to look at the whole sky. You just need to find that one line that goes through the sky, this, where the tabletop is, that plane. And if you find that plane, all of the planets will be on that. And there's one thing in that plane that you know where it is, and that's the sun is also in that plane. So if you know, if you go out into your yard and you see where the sun goes up and where it goes through the sky, that line and where it sets, then you can, all of the planets will be on that line. And you can do it, again, most people know this with their neighborhood. They know roughly where the sun is gonna be. And the brightest things on that line are the planets, okay? So I've just taught you a little trick. And I've taught you that trick because I've shown you not only the pieces of the system, but I've shown you how they're related to each other. And I've shown you that we have to take perspective. So imagine the same situation. You're thinking about transcription what does the world look like from the point of view of one transcription factor? What does the world look like from the point of view of a sequence in the DNA? If Not only do you need to see where all the pieces are and how they're related to each other, but you need to put your mind into the system at different places and look at it. And if you do, you can find out, you can raise all kinds of questions you've never thought of before. What does the world look like from the point of view of a transcription factor or a a uh, promoter sequence, for example. Well, okay. <laughs> so that's the first question you can answer. Another question you can answer is, you know that the sun rises and sets and it rises and sets and one day lasts 24 hours. Okay, so the time between one sunrise and the next sunrise is roughly 24 hours. What about the moon? The moon also rises and sets. How long is it between one moonrise and the next? Hmm, interesting. And there's other questions. You, I'm gonna leave that with you. You can figure it out if you do what I showed you the last and the last. Now imagine that you're standing on the moon, you're putting your mind in a different place in this system and you're looking at the earth. How long is it between one earth rise and the next? I'll give you a little hint, okay? One moon rise, and the next is one day plus 50 minutes. One earth rise and the next, there's never an earth rise and a never earth set. The earth is always in the same place in the sky, in the moon. And why is that? If you think about it, you'll figure it out. It's there, you need to know a couple more things, but you can figure it out. So, so this is what I want you to be able to do with your scientific models. But in order to do that, you first have to see them. And if the goal is to help you understand this system, I would like, when I teach you this system, I want you to be able to use it, not only to understand what all the pieces are, but to be able to use it. So let's go back to this text now. And I'm gonna ask you just one really, really simple question. And that is, again, so genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. 
Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. What's the connection between those two sentences? If, if, I, if I don't know anything about this, how will I connect the information of those two sentences? And the answer is, it's going to be really hard. So, so first of all, you need to know what each sentence means by itself. And then you have to know what connects it to the next sentence. And then you have to, there's something missing to connect those two things. And what's missing is a ghost. We're gonna talk about ghosts lots and lots and lots today. A ghost is missing. And the ghost is this model, DNA makes RNA makes proteins. If you know that, and if you know that genes are made of DNA, then you can figure this out. Now, then the story goes on and on and on. And I'm gonna show you what's wrong with the story and I'm gonna show you how to fix the story, okay? And the first thing is, is that as I'm reading this story, if I don't know anything about this, I'm building a map in my mind. And here's the map that I built. I first learned that genes encode proteins. So genes that contain instruction for making proteins. Then I learned that they're a small part of the genome and I learned that most of them are transcribed into RNA. That's one set of facts. Then I also learned that yeast generates transcripts which have functions. So here, genes, yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. The same is true for many other organisms. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts. What's a transcript? Oh, well, maybe a transcript is something that's transcribed. So maybe a transcript is RNA. Wow, if I'm smart and I'm willing to read this six times and use my big brain computer, I can figure that out. But it's not in the text. That connection is missing. And then the start sites of transcription, what's transcription? Well, it probably has something to do with RNAs. But anyway, OK, so I learned these facts. And I, this is the pattern that I would build in my mind. OK, I learned that promoters are the start sites of transcription. That's interesting, which are previously believed to happen in one direction. And now that's been contradicted, whatever that means. Anyway, to, to draw this, I use this little tool and I'll show you this link later because this is really cool. So this is what I learned. OK, if I again, if I work really hard, I can see that each of these has the word transcript in it. And maybe I can put them together somehow based on that word. But I have to do a lot of work to figure this out. Okay, now you're scientists and you have something in your head that already has all these pieces connected to each other. It's, it's the gene expression, okay? And this is my map of gene expression. I made a map, I just sat down one afternoon and in 10 minutes, I drew a map of everything I knew about gene expression and it's connected to each other. For example, we have DNA and DNA encodes non-coding RNA and encodes pre- Let's call it pre-mRNA exons, introns, and all that stuff in between, which has introns, exons, it has UTRs, and um, introns are removed through splicing, which includes alternative splicing, and then some other things happen. I just drew this map of when I thought about it, how everything is connected to each other. And I could understand this story because everything in there is already in my map. Okay, and it gave me one piece of new information, and that is that when the transcription machinery binds to DNA, we used to think that it does that in one direction, and now we've learned it does it in two directions. I can understand the story because I already have a map, and you understood the story because you already have a map. It's different than mine, and mine's not complete, and again, I did this very quickly, but either I already have a map and I stick the pieces of information into it in these places, these are the words that were used in the text, or I'm building a map and this is the map that that text is gonna give me. The goal, I told you right at the beginning of today, I'm gonna to try to help you draw a different picture of scientific communication in your head. Because I, I know that you have this idea probably organized in a certain way and it's all mixed up with other things. I want you to go away with a certain map of science communication and I want to control what that map looks like, okay? so. My goal is when I'm communicating something, I want to help you understand what something means. And that means, first of all, I have to see this organization. I have to see how this story is organized in my map. And then I have to make a smart guess 
about what you probably know already about it and what you think about it and maybe even what your map looks like. And then I need to help you rebuild that map the way that I want it to be so that you can use it in the ways that I want you to use it. Now, we're gonna use that text to show you exactly how this works, okay? So if you want to understand that story, you don't need to understand all of this at all. You just need a few, a few pieces of that system and you need to understand how they're connected to each other. So here are the pieces you need to understand that story. You need to know that in cells have this thing called the transcription machinery and they, it, it does several things. It binds to DNA. If you want, you can say it binds to promoter sequences in DNA, that's fine with me. It's not too important for the story at all, but we can put it in if we want. Um, when it does that, the DNA, it, it transcribes the DNA into RNA. And if you want, you can talk about what happens then, the RNA, some of them become, are encode proteins and others are non-coding. But what they learned was that when that happens, um, this machinery, they used to think it could only read things in one direction and transcribe in one direction. And they suddenly discovered it could do it in two directions. And that's the whole story. Now, if I'm gonna tell you that story, I need to tell you more, but there's something really interesting in this story that's also interesting and useful. And that is there's metaphors in this story. Um, Metaphors are ways of describing one thing that use another thing. So it, it, it tells you about something unfamiliar by linking it to something familiar. For example, if you say, Russ is a walking coffee pot or Russ is an old tree. I'm giving you two images and you're trying to map them onto each other somehow. And this is how you learned everything in science. You learn something new by mapping it onto something old. And so that's what a metaphor is. And this story contains a really central metaphor, which is the metaphor of a text and reading and writing. So what really happens in a cell is not anything at all like reading and writing, really. But there's some kind of basic pattern in there that we use that we use to understand this. And it's really important at this point that you understand that the metaphor of reading and writing is not really what happens in a cell. But also what you have in your head is also not really what happens in a cell. You've built an abstract laboratory, an inner laboratory based on concepts that you've built yourself. So for example, you all have a favorite protein. I want you to think of your protein now. Think of it really hard. And now I want you to write down its sequence. Oops. I want you to draw me a perfect three-dimensional map of its structure. Oops. You can't, I want you to write down all the isoforms and all the splice variants and all the variations that happen between different species of this protein. You can't, because what you have in your head is not the protein itself or any example of it. It's an abstract concept of the protein. And so it's a pattern. And when you understand that, then you can start to use that to help yourself. If you don't see, if you think that you have these real things in your head, then you're limited in what you can do with them because you think they're like photographs or they're like imprints or something and they're not. So if we understand that there's a pattern in this story, then we can use that pattern to tell it. So for example, so what we have is a machine, a transcription machinery, and it does several things. It, it, read, it binds to DNA, it reads the DNA, it understands the DNA and it transcribes the DNA. And the DNA is like a text, and like most texts in English, um, text is linear. That means it starts at the left and it goes to the right. And in one way it makes sense. And in the opposite direction, it doesn't make any sense. So what they've discovered is that actually this machine can read and write in both directions. And that's really interesting. And so if you understand that this is a pattern, it gives you a way to tell this story, which is much different. You can tell it in all kinds of ways, but that's the idea that you're trying to get across, okay? So I'm gonna show you how one way to rewrite this story. The first thing is we're gonna change the title. Sorry. 
transcription is bidirectional. Well, most of those words don't mean anything to most people. So how about this? Our DNA can be read backwards and forwards. So here's how I start. Our cells specialize and cope with the challenges of life by producing different sets of molecules. They do this by drawing on different recipes in their DNA that they use to build RNAs and then proteins. This process begins when a cellular machine scans DNA and locates the instructions it needs for a particular molecule. The machine attaches itself at the beginning of the code, reads it, and transcribes it letter by letter into an RNA molecule. Until now, scientists have thought that the recipes only made sense when read and transcribed in one direction, like this text. But scientists at Embo have now found that when it binds, the machine can often read and transcribe in both directions. I've told the whole story. I've used very heavily this metaphor of reading, machine, binding, writing. And now I can even do more. I can, I can explain how they found it. I can tell something about the real science. I can say, well, you know, how did they discover that? That's really interesting. So this does several things. It, it tries to show people not only explain it better, but it also puts it into a context where they understand what it means. So why would cells want to do this? Um, and it also tells it in a way that an, even a non-scientist can ask a really interesting question or can, can come to an interesting conclusion. For example, one thing that everyone asks when they read this is, well, okay, if you imagine really, really trying to build a machine that did this, how does the machine know which way it's supposed to read and write? That's a normal question you get because you understand the situation. It's also a very good scientific question. That's interesting. That means that somebody who knows no science by reading the story can ask a completely relevant scientific question. And they can also draw an interesting conclusion. So if you use the metaphor of a recipe, imagine suddenly you could read your grandma's recipe book backwards and forwards. That means you could cook at least twice as many things, right? And so, and that's also true. That means, in fact, there's a lot more, but you can actually, the genome holds at least twice as much information. Interesting. So not only have I explained the story, but I've given them, I've given them enough understanding of it, of the pattern and the concept to be able to ask an, an interesting question and draw an interesting conclusion from that story. And then I can also spend some time giving people a little bit more flavor of science and how it's, how it's put together. Now, there's a system to doing this, okay? The first thing is, is the first part of this, the reason I put this in is because I need to engage the reader. I need to relate it to them. I need to, I need to tell them why it could be important or, now, you're doing cancer research, and usually cancer researchers try to engage the public by telling them you are all going to die from cancer. How many people die of your type of cancer every year? That's how every one of these texts start. And starting now, I want to forbid you from ever doing that. I want you to find a different way to engage us in whatever story. And for the assignment that I'm going to give you, it's against the rules to start by telling how many people die of a disease. That's cheap. Everybody does it. No one cares anymore. And that means actually we should only care about the types of cancer that kill the most people. And, and actually we should all be doing cardiovascular research instead. No, 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 no. Anyway, so the, the beginning engages you. It, it tries to make you care, it tries to establish a link between what I'm doing and what you care about. The second thing is I use familiar patterns like recipes, machine, scan, instructions, text, things that you know. And these patterns, of course, they're not the real thing, but they're similar. Their structure is similar to what's in my head and the way I understand the system. And what's in my head is not the real thing either, remember. And that's why this is completely okay to do this. The second thing is, I really want to make sure that the person understands the real story. That means they really need to know what, what the scientists actually discovered. And they need to, and that needs to be in a place in the text where it makes its emphasis. So in the other text, they said, um, the only way that they told the real story was, the study redefines the concept of promoters contradicting the established notion 
that they support transcription in one direction only. That's like telling someone, okay, what we have here in this store is not coffee. <laughs> so guess what it might be, right? No, I don't know. Okay, okay, so how weird is that, right? So it, it, it does everything, it doesn't do any of these things. It doesn't, it just starts by saying, you know, it, giving you a fact about the genome, you know, uh, uh, genes that encode proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yes, well, that's interesting. I mean, and and how many hairs does a person have on their head? Or I don't, I don't know, anyway, so, The other thing that can happen is if you understand the pattern, you can say, okay, now I've, I've told this whole story about reading and writing. Let's think about reading and writing a little bit. What are some other things that you do when you read? Um, well, when I read, I read a lot of boring stuff. And when it gets really boring, I just skip a few pages often. You know, and when I read a paper, I always skip most of the materials and methods because I don't care about that. No, not, not really. Um, if I don't understand something, I can go back and reread it. Or I can stop to take a phone call or, you know, if I'm reading a book and I need to go to sleep, I can mark a page or I put a bookmark in there. I can go back a few pages. I can look things up. Let's go back to the cell now and say, does the transcription machinery ever skip boring passages? Now, that's something that I might not normally think of. I'm only thinking of it now because I've used this pattern of reading. And so I say, okay, so if it's really like reading, what are, how does reading work? Um, can I reread a sentence I've misunderstood? If, if, if the transcription of journey somehow gets blocked or if there's a hiccup, can it go back and fix things? Um, what happens if there's a phone call? Can it ever get interrupted when something else happens and then come back and can complete? So again, I have no idea, but, but this is how I have contributed to science because I think this way. And when I come to a project, and I see how person's ideas and how their inner laboratory is structured and how they're using these ideas. This, I ask them these questions and sometimes they're things that the person has never thought of because they don't see the pattern. So this gives you several different things and I'm gonna close this part of the talk by, by, by showing you that, that, that all of this, everything in, in science, everything has meaning based on this relationship to these hidden things. And the key hidden thing is all of the models that explain how things are connected and what things mean. So if, if you ever communicate science or teach science or learn science without understanding that whatever you're talking about is connected to models, you've failed. I mean, you may not have to say that, but, but we have had a model in that earlier story, we have had a model of the fact that the cell has a certain structure, there's a nucleus. In the nucleus, there's DNA, and that DNA is used to make RNA and make proteins. We have a model of this. And of course, it's much, much more complicated. But for this story, and we have a model of how that works, and that, that happens by this machine binding chemically and physically to this DNA molecule with the help of partners. And when it does that, then it, it undergoes this very physical, mechanical, chemical process of transcribing that into another molecule. Those are all models. And, and the way that that works, and so, so you have to see those connections. And you also have to see that any given project that you're working on, it's, it's related to a model somehow. So in some cases, you're modeling a new system. In other cases, you have a model and you're generating hypotheses to challenge it or improve it. Sometimes you've discovered, oh, there's a new kind of RNA in the cell that I never knew about before, circular RNAs. I wonder how that fits into our model of gene expression. Sometimes you say, okay, well, I know how this works in epithelial cells in the kidney. I wonder if it works also the same way in epithelial cells in, uh, during gastrulation. Um, or you can say, okay, I have a model of, sorry, I have a model of, of uh, genetics and now I need to integrate that with evolution or the way that we've understood the way the heart develops is wrong fundamentally. We've always thought it starts with the myocardium and now I think it starts with the endocardium or whatever and I'm gonna discard and replace it. If, if the relationship between whatever question you're working on and models is unclear, then there's no telling what will happen. And you have to realize 
that in many, many cases, what's missing in your communication, either with a colleague or with a, with a, uh, with a somebody from the public, is a, a, a lack of agreement on what that model is, what that model is like, and the relationship of your question to that model. Now, the reason I'm, I'm gonna show you one more example, we're almost done with the first part. I'm gonna show you one more example of how this works. And I'm gonna show you another aspect of this. And that is every question is not only related to different kinds of models, but it's embedded in a hierarchy of, of ideas, okay? So here's, here's one question that a student was asking a couple of years ago, and we're gonna analyze this. They wanted to know, they were writing their dissertation on what is the structural basis by which this transcription factor NF kappa B binds to DNA? And they were trying to understand that in terms of, okay, so what are the protein DNA chemistry aspects that occur here? They were looking at, so the, the physics of it, they were looking at different interaction partners that NF kappa B is, because what they were trying to understand is how it selectively activates different sets of genes specific target genes in different contexts. And it does that by binding to different partners and it does it by, um, by uh, because of the conformation of the, of the chromatin and so on and so on. Okay, so that's a very specific topic. And now we're gonna see how this is actually linked to much, much, much more, more general themes and why that's important. So what we're talking about here is the functions of this one transcription factor called NF kappa B. And again, cancer researchers know it quite well because there are lots of kinds of cancer in which the system is disrupted in this pathway. So we're interested in the functions of a transcription factor. And the reason why we're interested in transcription factor is we're trying to understand how cells decide which genes will be activated at a given time in a given context. And we need to know that because we're trying to understand how cells adapt and respond differently during situations like development and disease. And those processes are one, one way of, one context in which those processes are important are in understanding how many cell types arise from a single fertilized egg or progenitor like a cancer cell, whatever, whatever. And all of those things have to do with this much, much, this very most basic level of what we're trying to do. And that is to understand how an organism's health and its illnesses are connected to what's going on at all of those scales of organization in its body. Now, there's three reasons to see how these things are connected. The first reason is because as you work on this question, you're actually also working on all of these other levels at the same time. And what you find may tell you absolutely something specific about how NF kappa B works, but it may also tell you something about new about how cells adapt and respond. And it also may tell you something about the connection between a defect in this one part of the system and um, your health. So for example, you may find that it can't do this in some cases because the chromatin, there's some, you know, a sequence disrupts the structure of the chromatin, a mutation affects whether the cis and trans binding happens properly, whatever, and then it doesn't have the right confirmation. And so that explains why, and, and in fact, yeah. Okay, so you may find out something about all these levels. The other thing is, is that you're actually testing all of our models of these levels at the same time. So as you work on this, if something goes wrong, it may be because you've misunderstood something about NF kappa B and its functions, but it could also be that you've misunderstood something very fundamental. Our models of how cells adapt and respond are fundamentally different. So for example, um, if this model kill plays a role in development, we used to think that you know development happens, cells go through their lineages, develop in a very hierarchical way. When once you get to the bottom, you can't go back up. Well, now we have induced pluripotent stem cells so you can reprogram, you can take a somatic cell, you can make it into a stem cell and you can reprogram it. So that's, it's changed our idea of how that hierarchy works. If something goes wrong, it may be because you've made a mistake here, but it could also be that you're coming up against some fundamental misunderstanding of what's happened up here. And I told you at the beginning, this system that I'm gonna show you has something to do with improving your research. 
Well, a lot of Nobel Prize winners have won their prizes because they did something here at this level. But actually, they knew that this was connected. And so they picked a problem that would shake the highest levels of the tree. And they would actually discover something important about this. So there's a connection. And, and these hierarchies are important both for communication and research because this also gives you a way to tell a story to all kinds of different people, okay? So if you're gonna to talk to an expert on, on cancer, you can say, okay, you know that in cancer, um, one of the things that goes wrong is uh, we have problems in the activation of the genes uh, of genetic programs, pathways are disrupted. And um, one of the pathways that's commonly disrupted has to do with this transcription factor in F-kappa B, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that. So I enter at this level, if I'm going to talk to my grandmother about this story, I can say, Grandma, you know, you know, of course, you have some experience with this, that, that we all start as a single egg cell, you know, that gets fertilized, you know, that sex thing, that's what that does. And, and you know, that one cell, it grows and becomes all these different cells in our body, it becomes my skin cell, it becomes my hair cell, it becomes my tongue cell, it becomes my eye cell, you know, whatever. And, and how does that one cell do all these different things? Well, that's because each cell, they all have the same recipe book, but they each use different recipes to cook different things. And when they do that, they, they take on different shapes and they can have different functions. And there's in our cells, they also have machines that tell the cell which recipes to read and which ones to use to cook. And one of those machines that they use to pick the recipes is called nf kappa b And I'm trying to figure out how that machine knows which recipe to activate when and what happens if it goes wrong. So I've taken my grandmother from something she knows right down straight to this story. And I've told it also in a way that she can understand. And so understanding this pattern helps in communication because it shows, first of all, how this really detailed thing I'm working on is connected to a lot more general ideas. And that helps me find in that chart the right level to communicate to different audiences. And, and it also gives me a pathway to tell the story by going from this general idea all the way down to the specific thing. It's important to realize that for science because it shows that those that you're working with multiple layers of models at the same time, that are every project has that. And this is especially important in understanding negative results and understanding what results mean, because yeah, you're learning something about NF kappa B, but you may also be learning something about cancer or Alzheimer's disease or whatever. And, and you have to see these connections and doing it, the best way to do it is to force yourself to communicate it. Because you don't have to, if you're only talking to experts, you can stay down here in the basement and work you know, in your nerdy lab, computer lab, but, but you, you got to remember you're also doing all these things at the same time and your work has the potential to revise all those things. So as you are working on cancer, you are also working on many, many, many other things at the same time. And maybe what you discover actually will be much more important for those things than for cancer. I don't know. So we're going to stop there. <laughs> and take a coffee break. I really need a coffee break. And um, uh, so do we wanna deal with a couple of questions or comments before the break quickly or pick them up when we come back? Pamela, you can decide. So, uh, uh, so maybe, yeah, um, there was a bit of a discussion going on in the chat about probably if I sum this up correctly, uh, I hope I sum this up correctly, mm -hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about the audience. And people have been asking, um, okay, this is really great if I want to talk to my grandmother, but at some point I have to write for an audience also that's from my field and where we assume that we have the same mental map sort of. And as you know how it is when you write a manuscript for a paper, you are really forced to stick to a certain cell number. So you never are able to really elaborate on each point in the extent that you want to. Um, and I think this was the discussion, this uh, this was brought up here, that was the question. Okay, let, what, me, let me address that because that's really important. First of all, I'm, I'm going to, what I'm trying to do is to give you a system and this system works both for experts and for non-experts. So if you're gonna to talk to experts, you're gonna start right down here, but still you have to know that you're, you're, when you write your discussion, you're going to go up and you're gonna explore, well, okay, I've learned 
one thing about this particular system. But what I've also learned is maybe I've learned something more general about cells adaptation or responses. And so when you look at the structure of a discussion, you're going to see that people try to go as high as they can and say, what does, what, what does my question mean is one thing. What do my answers mean? What are they telling me about these things? So first of all, seeing this structure is really important, even when you're talking to experts. Secondly, the process that you go through and that we're going to go through this afternoon, you can, you should use, I, there, there's only one way that I can guarantee that your communication with experts will, be, will work as well as with your grandmother. You, you can use the same set of tools and structures and concepts to approach both. So, and, and I can tell you this because one of the things that I do the most is I help people write the letter to the editor of the journal. They've written their paper. And first of all, I help them hours and hours and hours with their paper, usually have to rewrite most of it. Because a lot of times in the paper, for example, this paper is reversing a model or is, is the, the meaning of this paper is the reason they ask the question is because we have this model of, for example, of the way mechanical stress is related to the early stages of heart development. And here's what the model is. And our work is challenging a part of that model. A lot of times it's not very clear to them the scientists what that relationship is and if you don't if you don't clarify that relationship again only a very select audience will understand exactly why you're asking this question and what it means so the models are always there the second thing is i believe that one of the most crucial functions of science communication between experts is there's no place that you can go in the literature to find all the models there's no like wikipedia of scientific models that God approved and has, has established. Models are dynamic. Models are continually being discussed and improved upon. And if you don't see each piece of work as in relationship to that set of systems and the, that discussion, you, it's, it's very difficult to see how that means. And again, scientists are often very lost in the details. And it's hard for a lot of times to kind of say, OK, wait a minute. Let me look at this slightly broader perspective. So, and and I and I actually don't believe. I think that people believe that they all have the same model in their head. How would you know that? The only way to know that is either to find a way to draw it and then to discuss it like this, or to look at a text and see. Well, I don't understand that. So, for example, if something's unclear in a text, it can mean several different things. Often it means there's something a little bit unclear in the way the scientist thinks about this. And I, I, the best example I could give you of this would be, you all know that evolution is absolutely fundamental to understanding everything in biology. I guarantee you that if I asked you all to write a three sentence ex, uh, um, uh, definition of natural selection, which is one of the three pillars of evolution that you would all write something slightly different and half of them would be pretty wrong. I, I've done this experiment many times. Or if I were to ask you about a key concept in your field like robustness, what does robustness mean? Now, it's interesting to me that you will find that people actually think about these things different ways. And in science communication, that has a function like variation in biology and that is because everyone thinks about it a little bit differently, it, it creates an energy where people are trying to solve questions in slightly different ways using slightly different model systems. And this is how the actual results emerge is from that kind of debate. But, but this relationship needs to be clear. And anytime it's unclear, the meaning of the paper, people, again, you know, I, I do this, most of my work and now is helping people with papers. Uh, and this, these are established scientists. And always finding clarity is a matter of, of, of establishing this relationship between why they're asking the question. It has to do with the models and, and also selling it to the journals, explaining what the paper means to the journals. You would be amazed how many scientists struggle and, and write a version of that letter of the first case, which is usually pretty bad. <laughs> Because it's law, it's, it, it doesn't focus, it doesn't really take the perspective of the journal or the journal's audiences or whatever. So 
everything I'm telling you is relevant for both. Again, it's up to me to prove that to you. And we'll do that through the exercises um, and through the more practical things this afternoon. So I, again, I, at the moment, I don't think I've proven that to you, but we will when we get to your work, because I will show you in your text and in your, the, the one thing you'll see is that when you go to do this assignment, I think you will already approach it differently than you would have without having had this course. We'll see. That's that's my test. Okay, so hope we dealt with that. And and it's not and it's usually not a matter of explaining lots and lots and lots more things because my text about DNA transcription was not longer than the other text. It was just structured differently, and that makes all the difference. It's not I'm going to have to explain everything. There's no way that I can teach my grandmother this. I can't but I don't need to, because all I need to teach her is that. But the first thing is I have to see that that's the story. Okay, next, anything else? Uh, no, that was, I think the major Okay, point. so again, um, I've, I've done this many times and, and there's a whole process, okay? This is just the first step. The first step is to show you what's going on, to, to sort of show you there's a secret layer here and a little bit about how it's structured. In the next part, after we take a coffee break, I'm gonna show you some really more funny examples of how this works. And then this afternoon, we're gonna take the first steps to applying it. Um, the best kind of course, the, two days is a really good amount of work. What the, the best kind of teaching is actually, if I can go to a, a single research lab and work with them, in a couple of blocks over a few days, because then it becomes sustainable. Then everybody starts to kind of think the same way. Then they can really help each other. And, and if a group takes this on and does this, it, it makes it, it changes their lives. It truly changes their lives. And I've seen this many times, but this is already a good group that we have here because you can stay in contact and you can help each other also with this. And again, we'll see how that works this afternoon. Okay, let's have a break and we'll come back. I'm going to put this screen on. This is some reference stuff uh, that we'll talk about when we come back. Okay, and uh, I'll give her this file. Uh, when do you suggest we come back? It's, uh, 10 uh, minutes, 10 minutes. 10, okay, so 20 And then we'll just go until about 12. The next session will be really short and I'll just show you a few funny tricks, so a few magic tricks. Okay, so then let's say um, 11.25. Okay, that's good. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. See you then. Yeah. Pamela, are you still there? Yes. Um, you can stop the recording and then we yeah, can start. I will. On okay. Welcome back and we are live. <laughs> okay, so so I, I put up on the screen a few references. Uh, the first is I run a blog um, called Good Science Writing. It's the subtitle of the blog is the good, the bad, and the completely ridiculous. A lot of this blog is devoted toward crazy stuff like for example, some colleagues and I wrote a very serious paper called The Evolution of Pizza, in which we took a bioinformatics approach to trying to understand the phylogeny of, of all the species of pizza out there. Um, I got that published, in fact, which was funny. Um, but I've been using this tool to kind of draw ideas, um, because one thing that we need constantly in, in our work, I mean, in order to talk about models and in order to talk about these systems of thinking about things, we need to be able to represent them. And obviously texts are one way, graphs are another way, computer diagrams are another way, um, algorithms. But, but the tool that I've been using to kind of draw these bubbles and connect them with lines is called CMAP tools. And this was invented by a fantastic teacher uh, named Joe Nowak, who I think is still alive. I got to meet him. He's it's it's 50 years old at least, but people use these for all kinds of things, and I just find it very useful. If if you're not a native English speaker, um, I recommend this book very highly. This is a a big fat book. You can find it online for cheap or or invest in it and buy it because this is a combination between a, a dictionary and a grammar book. So. If there's some expression or word that you're not sure that you're using in exactly the right way, this, this is a really great book. It'll give you examples of how to use that word, what other words people confuse it with, and it gives you plenty of examples of when you should use it. 
and whatnot. And this last book is by the guru, the absolute world master of clarifying writing. Um, he's written this book called On Writing Well, and and he 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 talks about clarity in writing and sort of achieving the most straightforward way of expressing ideas um, possible and removing clutter from writing. And it's just, it's a great read. And he also talks about the process a lot. Um, the, the discussion before made me realize that this is always an issue. Um, I'm not talking about writing oversimplifying or marketing or explaining things to your grandmother only. I'm talking about explaining things to anyone and understanding what things mean. And again, what this work has shown me is simply that scientists have the same, exactly the same types of problems when they communicate with other experts in their field. They especially have these problems when a chemist is talking to a bioinformaticist, is talking to a biologist, is talking to a clinician. Anytime you cross disciplinary boundaries, you have to be extremely aware of, of the fact that you, people in these different fields construct knowledge differently and use different models. And um, particularly in the afternoon session, I'll show you how this applies to your own communication and your own work. And, and I have loads of examples of this. Um, and before we do that, I, th I thought I would take the rest of the time before lunch just to show you that this problem has some kind of unexpected dimensions um, that, that you wouldn't maybe think of. So these ghosts, they're, they're a hidden structure, they're a hidden patterns and hidden, hidden sort of computer programs that are running in our minds that, that actually we always use all the time to understand what things mean and to explain things to each other, um, even, even to explain you know, our projects to each other and, and even more simple things. And to give you a real good example of this, um, there, there's, there's two that I like to give you. The first is um, you all know that I, if any of you who drive a, a car, uh, if you know if if you're thinking a lot about work and you get in your car and you drive home, I've this has happened to me. Uh, I would drive from work to home and I would arrive at home and I would be sitting in my car in my driveway, and I would have no memory of that drive at all because I was thinking about something completely different. Or it may also happen to you, like if you're taking the bus or, you know, you'll get on the bus, you'll take the bus, you get off the right place, you'll walk home and you'll be at home and you won't remember anything from that trip. And that's because if, if you've traveled a certain route enough times, you build a model of it in your head and you're kind of on autopilot. You can, you can drive that model or you can, you, can, uh, you can navigate using that model and you don't have to think about it at all um, unless something startling happens or dangerous happens and you need to wake up and, and realize what's going on. But, but we do this all the time. And the problem is, is that sometimes we use the wrong programs to, to do the wrong thing. Okay. So for example, um, I showed you the chessboard. I showed you the chessboard before, and I said that when we look at this, each of us sees something different. Um, even chess masters would see something different. That would be the equivalent it would be two scientists reading a paper. They, they, would, they would see many of the same things, but they would also see different things. And so if I show you this, um, I'm sure most of you recognize this. And again, if I have you in a group, we can actually discuss this, but, but you probably recognize this as a, as a nucleosome in, in the nucleus. And most people recognize it because they see, okay, this is DNA, they recognize that structure and they recognize that it's in kind of a circle. And then they see these things in the middle, which are proteins. And okay, when does that happen? That happens when you have these histone proteins packed into a nucleus. Um, what you're seeing here is you're seeing what's on the 
screen, but you're also seeing this model in your mind. And that model has lots of things in it. It, it, it tells you something about, you know, if you know the structure of a nucleosome, you know that it has these eight histones bound up in this DNA. And here, what you see is DNA, and then you see four different colors. Well, you're assuming that on the backside, it's symmetric. So there'll be four other proteins on the backside. Um, you're assuming that the green things belong to one thing and the blue things belong to another thing. So this is one histone. The green is a different one. The red is a different one. The yellow is a different one. And there's no way intuitively to know that. It, you, it's, it's an assumption that we make because we assume that if you have a color, a yellow thing is probably one thing and a blue thing is probably another thing, even though they're spread apart from each other a little bit. Um, but this, this image, so this image contains ghosts. If you show this to a non-scientist, they have no idea what they're looking at. In fact, we put a picture of this on the door of our office one time and somebody who came by said, oh, you know, that's an interesting carnival hat. You know, they thought it was some kind of thing that you were supposed to put on your head and wear. They didn't realize that this is actually a diagram of molecules. Um, but there's even more ghosts in this image that have to do with, you've learned to see a two-dimensional representation in three dimensions. So somewhere you learned that, you know, shading by looking at lots of pictures, you learn that this is supposed to represent a three-dimensional thing, even though it's flat and your brain automatically sees foreground, background, fat, uh, compressed. I don't know how thick you see this, but you do see some thickness there. And the other thing is the biggest sort of ghost in this image is really not there. And that's what's all this white stuff. And all that white stuff is the fact that this only happens in a very specific chemical environment under very specific conditions. So it only occurs in the chemistry of the nucleus and that's not also in the image. So this thing only exists in a particular context of of biology, knowledge, chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. But the problem is what happens if you have programs and ways of interpreting things that do not come from science that you learn somewhere else, but then you're that are hiding inside of this image. So again, for example, I told you that we learned to see two dimensional images in three dimensions. Well, here's another example of something we learned to look at. This is an MRI image, obviously, of the brain, a high resolution MRI image produced by one of our groups. And I did a workshop with these people on, on ghosts and images because um, a lot of times the, the images that we use in, in science, they have to be decoded or explained to people. And there's a danger that in the data that we see and in the images we see, we're bringing in ghosts that are from outside of science. So, I don't know where you learn to look at grayscale images. I learned, I'm really old, okay? And so I learned we had a black and white television when I was a child and, and you've seen black and white films and there were black and white images. And so you learn to look at people, you learn to look at familiar objects and you say, okay, that bit of white is probably part of one thing. And if it's black, it's part of another thing. So again, you're, you're doing, your brain is doing all this kinds of analysis on this you don't see all of the scales of gray here in this image. There's, I don't know how many, but there's a lot, okay? And so your brain simplifies this and says, okay, that's a white thing. That's probably a structure that's connected to another, this all one structure. And the gray is probably a different structure. And this is a different structure. And, and so your brain is looking at this and it's simplifying it. It's taking out information and making decisions about what's noise and what's background, what's signal and what's noise. So I was working with this group and when I looked at this, I, I know that there's a danger that when we look at things, we're bringing in extra knowledge or extra programs. I, I know that ghosts always exist everywhere. So I go looking for them and I said, okay, well, I wonder if what we see here is actually what we're supposed to see. <clears throat> and so I did this very simple thing. And that is I told my computer, okay, maybe I'm not seeing all of the gradations of gray that I need to see. 
maybe maybe there's a lot more information here that my brain just doesn't see. And I'm, I'm thinking, okay, this is one structure, but maybe it's not one structure because I just can't see finer differences. And in, in an MRI image, the gray has to do with the, the you know, um, it has to do with the amount of uh, uh, liquid and and so small differences can be very significant. So what I did was I took Photoshop and I forced I colorized this by forcing very small differences into larger differences. And what I got was this image. So I, I got this image of, of from here and suddenly again I just told the computer to pick very small gradations and give them very different colors. And I did this by hand and I saw suddenly all, all of these substructures. And I asked the scientist, well, is this just an artifact or is this real? And he said, no, no, it's real because those difference in gray tones are actually meaningful. And what happened as a result of this was he went back and they instituted a new way of looking and analyzing their MRI images because they had just been assuming that they were seeing things but they hadn't been trained on these images. They'd been trained on other kinds of images to look for other kinds of structures. And the eye is not capable of actually perceiving all the information in this image. Um, I taught this course last year in Oslo and a friend of mine there runs an electron microscope lab. And one of his students ran to his black, white, grayscale microscope images and started to do this experiment with him. And he found a structure in the epithelia of fish gills that had never been seen before, just by color, but just by doing this experiment, by realizing, oh my God, okay, I, I learned to look at black and white images in one way. Maybe I'm not seeing everything that's there. I'm gonna force it. And he discovered this new cellular structure. I don't know what he called it yet, but anyway, so so understanding that these things infect our thinking and that the patterns that we use to understand science are similar to the patterns we use to understand other things. That's helpful in communication, but it's also helpful in research because the only way to free yourself from those patterns and to really look at a system is to break them. And breaking them means communicating them somehow. Okay, so another example, the same group, another, we we're on a retreat and we did an exercise in the way we see things and the way we describe things. So when you write a text, or when, you, when you write about data, you put it into language and a kind of transformation occurs there. And so we did an exercise where everyone had to go into the kitchen and they had to find an object and then come back and describe this object to the group. And there were two rules. They couldn't say the name of it and they also couldn't say what it was used for, okay? And so, one person went into the kitchen. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought maybe something interesting will happen. And so one person chose this and they came back and they described it very carefully to the group. I thought they did a great job. And this was, it turned out to be really interesting because half of the people in the group drew this and the other half drew something else. And what they drew was this. Now, if you look at this and look at this and imagine having to do this task, it's, it's a metal thing. It's about eight centimeters long and, and it starts as a rod and that breaks down into, you can just imagine how you would describe this. It would be pretty easy to describe this in a way that you wouldn't draw this. You, you could find a way, but you would only do that if you realized that both of these things are in the kitchen. He only found this one thing. And so he, he wasn't thinking, okay, there may be something else in there that it could be confused with. And what's interesting about this is, yeah, they have pretty much the same structure and they also have the same function, which is interesting, function structure relationship. But the, the main thing was is the way that he described this thing, his, his model, his textual model of this was written a certain way because he just didn't realize that there was something else that it could be confused with. Now, let's imagine you're all, I, I presume you're all working on something related to a type of cancer or several types of cancer or a method related to cancer. 
this is cancer, or this is gut cancer, or this is um, white blood cells, or this is um, T cells, or this is, you can describe those things however you want. You can describe a type of cancer however you want. And the way we do it is based on carefully observing it and so on and so on. But what a thing is, is also what it is not. So this is what I call a ghost of omission. And that is, if you just don't know that this thing exists, it will configure how you describe this. So, and we've learned this many, many times over the last decade or two decades, that what we used to think of as one type of cancer is actually four different kinds of cancer. And if you treat them the same, you make all kinds of mistakes. It messes up your diagnosis. It messes up your, your patient, uh, the, the way that you design a patient's therapy. Um, you, you understand either the mechanisms are different that underlie them, or they have the same mechanisms, but they produce different phenotypes depending on interaction with the gene, et cetera, et cetera. So actually, when you discover this new type of cancer, you ought to go back and redefine this other one. It ought to change the way that you've described this. That often does not happen. So you have these textbook things that are in the textbooks that are in your brains. It's like, you know, there's, there's certain metaphors that have been used for a long time, like the key and lock metaphor for a receptor and a ligand binding to it. Well, everybody has that in their head and now suddenly we discover it's not right and we need to change it. Will you see it? You can find it in texts, you can find papers. And right now in papers out in the literature, there's all kinds of evidence that the way we think about things is not right. It's not right. In 50 years, we're gonna think of differently about these things. And there's evidence already for that. And the way to find it, sometimes you can just find it in the text. So if I see something in a text that's unclear, like I read a text about robustness, and I thought this scientist is using this word in a way that I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. I have a different idea of what that means. And I realized there's no one definition of what that means out there in the world. And so I got into a debate with the scientists about what he meant. And actually we discovered something really, really interesting. And that became the, the basis of a large EU proposal on the topic of robustness uh, that came out of Potsdam. Um, anyway, very interesting. These things happen, but you have to realize that they're there and you have to realize that there's this intersection between scientific thinking and non-scientific thinking. And you have to see when that's configuring the way that you're looking at a system. And the easiest way to see it is to try to write about it or to give a talk about it and to study very carefully the clarity and the structure of that text, even for experts, because that's gonna show you, okay, well, I, I haven't said that in a very clear way. And again, half the time, it's not because it, yeah, it's confused in your head, but it, it's confused in your head because everybody in the field is like, there's different explanations or different definitions. And only when you realize that can you actually generate the question you need to ask to resolve this. So every time I read a paper, I find five things that open up a whole Pandora's box of some issue in science that is, that is um, unclear right now. And I would never have seen those things, except I'm asking myself, okay, what exactly does this mean? What are the implications? How does it relate to, to other similar things? Now, these ghosts, you can also use them to generate really interesting scientific questions. I, I gave you one example of that before with reading the text. I said, okay, let's think about the pattern of reading. When I read and transcribe something, if I think about the cell, I'm thinking of this machine that binds to DNA and it does, but let's think more generally about sort of that structure of that activity of reading. Reading is an activity that, you, that, that of course it's linear, but you can also, in our real lives, we interrupt it. Does that ever happen in the cell? The only reason I thought of asking that question myself was because I saw that I was applying this pattern to it. Now, if I understand those patterns and there's all kinds of things I can do with them. So I showed you again, this is my map of gene expression and has all these things in it. It has, you know, translation, it has transcription, it has enhancers, it has promoters, and it just shows how these things are connected in my mind. It has splicing, it has alternative splicing, it has 
isoforms, it has exon junction complexes, it has everything in it. Now, I'm a pretty bad chess player. I can usually only see one or two moves ahead. And so in my mind, when I'm looking at this, I usually think of them in clusters or groups. I'm, when I'm thinking about splicing, I'm thinking about splicing and I'm not thinking about signaling cascades, although you could, right? Um, and so this is a map of what's in my head. And I was looking at this, I drew it out and I printed it on a big board. And one thing I did with this was I said, okay, this is how I see processes connected in my head. I wonder if that maps onto actually the geography of a cell. So are the things that are close together in my head, are they also close together in space in the cell? Huh, that's a weird question. And so I thought, okay, so like where does splicing, I just asked, do I know where all of these ha things happen? And I realized something that I'd never known before. I was just assuming the whole time that splicing happens in the cell nucleus. Because I, I hadn't, no one had ever told me that explicitly, but whenever you come up with splicing, you know, you, you get like the, you know, you have a pre mRNA and then it gets spliced and then all these things happen and then it gets exported from the nucleus. Then you have a messenger RNA, which gets exported and then translated. And then I started to talk about, is it, is it really true? I never thought of asking, is that actually true before? And then I find out that there's all this evidence now that splicing can happen in the cytosome plasm, especially in neurons. So one question you can ask is, where do all these things happen in the cell? Are they close by? Or are they far apart? Um, with signaling, one thing that people didn't know was, if you talk about these signaling complexes and cascades, a lot of them are clustered right at the membrane. And it's only like the last couple of steps where something actually moves or whatever. Um, another thing you can do with this is you can do what I call the model dartboard. And I went to some friends of mine, they play darts. I got two darts and I made a big poster of this thing and I hung it on my wall and I sat on the other side of the room and I just threw darts at it, back, back. And wherever those darts landed, I said, is there any connection between these two things? So for example, I'm gonna just do it completely randomly. Is there any connection between exons and enzymes? Each of you is asking yourself a question that you may not have asked before. And I bet that each of you can probably construct a scenario in which there's a connection between enzymes and exons. I surely can. And you can go to the literature and you can say, okay, let's put these two things. Is there any connection between exon junction complexes and histones? Huh, that's interesting. It's something, and again, maybe 60% of these questions will, be ridiculous or maybe nobody's ever tried to ask this question before because it's just not the way we normally think through things or generate questions but if you see the whole board then you can play you can do exercises you can play other kinds of games so this is the one of the first places where there's a connection between understanding this inner laboratory which you need to do for communication but it can also start to change how you generate questions from your models and how you do research. Um, I, I gave you the example of reading and, and there's lots of other examples of that. Every, every time, so one of, the, one of the best reasons to use metaphors is when you have to communicate to a non-scientist. So for example, I had a student who was, um, who was working on this really complicated story about, um, a, an autoimmune disease, which was happening because a protein during its processing, it got sugars attached to it. And this one enzyme attached a particular sugar and it was recognized by an auto antibody. And that caused this autoimmune disease. And the student was trying to reconstitute this in the laboratory. And they did it in the test tube and they found that they could get exactly the same reaction even when this one particular protein wasn't there. So it meant that some other substrate was, this chemical process was happening to some other substrate. Now their challenge was to tell the story to their grandmother, which was quite complicated. 
And um, the only way that we could figure out how to do it was to imagine this little story about the man, a man with a bird on his hat. And uh, the idea was that there's a story, there's a guy named George and every day he goes out and he buys a cigar and a newspaper and he comes home and, but his wife is very worried about his health. So before he goes out the door, she says, don't forget your hat. So she puts the hat on his head he goes outside and buys his newspaper and a cigar. And on the way home, there's a bird that has learned to recognize this hat. And the bird flies down and lands on George's hat and he gives it some candy or a piece of his cigar or something and the bird is happy and leaves. Well, one day George is sick, so he can't, he can't go out and buy his newspaper, but somebody else is there and they say, oh, George, okay, I'll go buy your, I'll, I'll go buy your newspaper and, and your cigar. And George's wife says, don't forget the hat. So she puts the hat on the guy's head and he goes out and buys the newspaper. And the same thing happens. Well, that little story was funny because, because you have all the, and the question is who was the visitor, right? So who's the other substrate if it's not George or the mag protein? So the, the, the interesting thing about that was she found a way to tell the whole story where you had all the pieces and the relationships were similar. So you had the husband, the substrate, you had the enzyme, which attaches something. In this case, it's a hat and the cell was sugar. And you have the recognition event, which is the bird coming down. And, and all the relationships are similar. So we have an enzyme, an attacher. We have a thing that gets attached. We have a thing that gets attached to, we have a recognizer. Now you're gonna say, okay, well, in, in real biology, it's not really like that. Okay, so, you know, the, the enzyme, it's not a hat, it's a sugar. But I tell you the pattern that you have in your head for an enzyme attaching a sugar is not the real thing. It's, it's a concept, it's also a metaphor. It's a, it's a model that you have. And so again, this shows how you can use this thing, but then you can also start to play these games with it. You can say, okay, let's imagine that this works very, they're very well, but on Sundays, when George, everything is exactly the same, but on Sundays, when George goes out to buy his newspaper and his cigar with his hat on, the bird doesn't come. Why can't, so, one time a week, my experiment doesn't work. <laughs> or one time a week, it doesn't work. And there's maybe lots of different reasons you could imagine. Maybe on Sundays, there's lots of other people out and about. And so the bird goes someplace else because it has a higher affinity for something else than George on that day under those conditions. Um, maybe on Sunday is the only day that the newspaper is printed in color the other days it's black and white. So the combination of seeing a hat in a colored newspaper is frightening to the bird and the bird doesn't come down. Now, all of these scenarios are just little stories and patterns, but you can take them all back to the scientific system and you can say, okay, what would the equivalent be of lots of people in the park and this recognition event not happening? So why in some people does this autoimmune disease develop, but not in other people? You can, you can go back and you can play with this system because you understand it has, it has a pattern into it. And so this is a crucial thing. And, and again, you only see the structure in your head. You have, this is only one part of a very, very small complex of things that I know about biology and have learned about biology. I can't see them all at the same time. The only way that I can see what's in my head is to draw it, to map it, to write about it, to talk about it. And this is something that I would talk through with experts. It's not something I would talk through with my grand. It can help if I'm talking to my grandmother because it can help me see, I don't have to explain all of gene expression to her. I only need those few parts of that system to explain that story. So it helps you focus. But it also has many, many interesting scientific uses because the laboratory that you have in your head is extremely complex. It has lots of stuff in it, lots of connections. And the only way to see those things is to 
map them is to get them into the world where you can discuss them with someone. And so communication is here as a way of telling you all the cool stuff that I've done, but it's mostly here as a way for me to present a problem, its relationship to a complex of the way that I have scientific knowledge organized in my head and the way that the field has it organized in its head right now, which is dynamic and changing. And then to debate and negotiate through papers and talks and conferences and posters and experiments to, to debate and negotiate what the structure should look like and to use it to generate new experiments. But, but to do all of that, you need to see it and you need to verbalize it, you need to articulate it. And this map is one way to do that. And when you have the map, then you have a game board that you can play different kinds of games on. When you've tried to explain something to your grandmother, it gives you a different kind of game that you can play. You can ask yourself, what happens on Sundays? Or what happens, what is re reading like? Would these other types of reading also happen when the transcription machinery tries to read the genome? Um, and and you'll, you'll come to a point where the metaphor doesn't work, obviously, but that will tell you something about the pattern that you, you, you've used. And it, it will tell you something really important. A lot of times people don't draw, they talk about for example, protein complexes, and they never try to actually draw them. Um, I worked, I don't know if you know this, there's this the fantastic series of animations on cellular processes called the lives of the cell, where you see like a, a microtubule uh, and a motor walking down and dragging this big cargo. And I know the guy who animated that. And when, when he began doing that, he said, you know, he immediately came into all of these questions and challenges because nobody ever tried to do it at that resolution before. And nobody could actually see how each foot actually moves and whether it moves like this or whether it moves like this and, and, and what all the small parts of that, he had to resolve that just to draw the thing. And so drawing it, talking about it, giving talks about it, writing about it, these are all game boards that we put out there and they allow us to play the, the, again, they have a crucial function because you need to do it. You always need to explain your work. But the real function of those scientific texts and those papers for your colleagues is not just to tell them what you think, but it's to engage in a large game about what the models that we're using are, what the components are, what they're like, how we should change them, how we can use them to generate new questions and new hypotheses. And the only way to do that is to see the game. So I told you at the beginning, I think we've misunderstood what communication is for. It's not just a way to pack up your ideas and explain them to other people and get lots of money. It's not just a way to convince people that you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a game board where we're negotiating the fundamental aspect of science, which is what models are we using? Are they correct? What questions can we use to generate them? from them and 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 how is this all connected to each other and if you don't see that that's the goal then communication gets very very confusing and we're going to take the lunch break in just a minute but when we come back i'm going to start by showing you two examples of science communication written for scientists by scientists one which is quite good and the other one which goes really, really wrong. And it's exactly for these reasons. And then we're gonna translate all this into a series of very practical steps and practice that this afternoon. Your assignment is gonna to be to write me a page or a page and a half summary. And I'll put this up on the board after lunch. One or one and a half pages summarizing your research or an experiment or a project that you're working on right now. So to basically take a scientific question that you're working on, it's fine if you, you know, it could be the topic of the paper or your dissertation or whatever, or some thing that you're going to start, it doesn't matter, and explain it to people who are smart, who are scientists, but they're not directly from your field. Like if you're writing a paper for science or nature, and you were gonna to try to get a whole bunch of people to read it. Um, um, so that's going to be the assignment, and we'll talk about the schedule and everything uh, when we come back. So before we break for lunch, are there any more questions or, or 
things that people would like to ask. I hope this has, it's been a journey the whole morning. I know it's been a long and, and hopefully not too boring journey, but um, um, I, 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 hope, I hope you see that there's a structure here that we're gonna take and go further with. Um, but any questions or comments so far? Uh, no, actually, um, I would, uh, the only question that I received is whether we will get uh, the slides. Yes. Because you were um, listing some resources there and that yeah. might be of interest to check yeah. that. Yeah, you'll have the slides. And again, I, I, my, my feeling is, is that the morning session went pretty well that I wouldn't, it's probably better than the last time I tried to film this. So I'll probably also put the talk up on my blog. Um, we'll see. But in any case, uh, um, yeah, and, and this afternoon, like I said, the the reason why I do this, which is, I, it's, it's a crazy thing to try to do. And, and, you know, I tried all kinds of ways to actually do this. And what I found is if, if we do this, if you do a writing assignment, and then later, if you're interested, we could do a, a presentation skills course. It's, it's the same stuff. And, and it, it just, it really changes something. I, I don't understand. It's a little bit mysterious still to me. Um, but, it, but it actually does have a pretty big impact on the way people approach this and it makes it a lot easier for them somehow for most people, not everybody. I mean, you know, we're all unique. We all have unique genomes that deal with these things in unique ways. So, but in any case, so there's a reason behind all this and, and hopefully it'll be clear by the end of the day and certainly by the next session that we have. So have a nice lunch. We'll come back at shortly after one. Let's say 105, that'll give us one hour and two minutes, if that's okay. And then we'll just work for probably two hours and we'll do some group work and it'll be more, you'll, it'll be highly interactive this afternoon. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. Thank you very much. Sure. See you then. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, okay. I'll stop the recording then. Yeah. Thank you very much.